Movement, Living to Play, and Playing to Live with Nicole Haywood. Stay inspired. You prioritize movement in your life. Could you share with us more about how you found different exercises that inspire you and motivate you? Yes, of course. Yeah, movement is definitely a huge part of my life. And especially um, since we all ex are experiencing this pandemic, I feel like since I am a little bit of a gym rat. So to say I um, had to discover new ways during the pandemic to stay active and move my body, it's such a privilege to be able to move around. Um, in middle school, I always played baseball because my brother played baseball and then I played basketball and soccer I was super active as a kid and as I started focusing in more on bassoon my team sports weren't as big of a part of my life and then I feel like in college is where I you know discovered the gym started discovering yoga I practiced yoga for a big chunk of my time when I was at the University of Texas and I've always just had a love for being walking in nature, hiking. Um, not the biggest swimmer, but sometimes it just feels good to get in the pool. I just think it just feels great to move your body. And uh, in my interview that's posted, I talked a little bit about a performance injury I had been dealing with and kind of humbling to not be able to move my body in the same ways, but then... Um, empowering to know that I can build back up and get back to 100%. And I, I'm definitely a super active at Orange Theory Fitness, and that's kind of where I've been working out for the past three years now. But when I was at Rice, I was always in group exercise classes. I need to work out in a group. I'm not someone that can work out alone. I guess maybe it comes from the team sports or – I need, I need someone yelling at me like a coach you know, or, or else I'll give up too soon. You know, I need someone motivating me. And, but yeah, I just think coming from a point of it's a privilege to move our body and not, it's definitely not a punishment. You know, it's not like, oh, I ate a burger. I should exercise. No, 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 that's not how it works. But that it feels good. You get those good endorphins, stress management. I mean, making friends with your performance anxiety Working out helps me sleep better if I'm stressed and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And just especially, I think there's a mental training aspect of it, too. From having played team sports, learning grit and, and how to lose or, you know, how to make a mistake, how to have an error in a game and pick yourself back up, I think so applicable to the Zoom. And with dealing with my in injury... I felt like I couldn't practice as much as I wanted to initially, which was, it was frustrating, kind of soul crushing to say the least. And then in the gym, also experiencing that humbling of knowing I'm strong, but I can't even pick up the five pound weight, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, I felt like my growth in the gym and with the Zoom, through different phases of my life, whether I'm injured or whether I'm I'm happier, whether I'm just like having a bad day. I feel like they're working in tandem with each other. It's just a huge stress management tool for me. And it's so, so empowering and definitely a, a privilege to be able bodied and be able to move, mm -hmm. you know, this one body that we have. So, uh, and in the pandemic, I just ended up walking around so much, so many neighborhood walks, so many, it was, um, in patio workouts, I just needed um, just to get those endorphins going, you know, at a time. Mm -hmm. Like, just like the students, sometimes it's up and sometimes it's down or, you know, you're like, wait, I was able to run so much faster, like, last week. But, you know, you might wake up and then realize today's just a day you're going to run slower or today's just a day that you're going to play that excerpt slower. Or something, but yeah, it got me grace and fluidity in our practice. Have you noticed with your exercise, with them coming together, where 
certain exercises were improving your bassoon playing or you were saying, oh, wow, my bassoon playing really helped with doing this, you know, movement. Yeah. I wonder, you know, I always, before I got a performance injury or maybe it was a gym injury or combination of the two in the spring in April and May of 2021, I always thought that, I still think so, I still think this way, that training the larger muscle groups is good for counteracting because we are such small muscle athletes at least. With bassoon, sometimes we have this habit of being inward and hunched over and I occasionally forget all the few years of Alexander technique practice and um, I think things I think that have helped with being like this when I'm playing bassoon have been you know, like rowing to open my body up, I guess, with weights. I'm trying to think, I would assume that maybe none of the leg stuff helps with bassoon, but maybe <laughs> it does, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And But I do think, yeah, doing as many opposite motions as you can with bassoon playing this way, if you can get the body opened up, it's like so good to train those muscles and man, keep, every, keep everything healthy. In. And I, I've been, since being injured, I've been so much more in tune with my body and when I'm pushing. I think since, you know, we're in this pandemic and in the spring I wasn't doing much. I was practicing and making reads, but all I was really, really doing was working out. Maybe it was a bad coping mechanism. And I think I was doing either too much in the gym and not listening to my body and being like, oh, look how good my triceps look. And then, oh, <laughs> <You know? laughs> oh. so yeah, this is like, in, yeah, in, just really being in tune with my body and being present. I'm finding running and having to regulate the breath and starting to incorporate that more with bassoon playing where it'll be two bars, you know, two bars before coming into play. It's like a bar out, a four beat, yes. and a bar in of, in of breath. I don't, it's interesting. Yes, yes. sometimes I, I, I do that sometimes in the orchestra, especially – there's some moments if something is stressful is coming up and I feel myself zoning in, which is the opposite. I want to, you know, widen my view, um, think about the bigger picture. And sometimes I will just, and then, okay, we're going or something, or, you know, there's something, some big calming breaths like that. But yeah, this, the breath is so important. When I was at the University of Texas in my undergrad, one of my studio mates was swimming all the time. And I feel like another one of my studio mates started swimming. And I think finally I was like, I'm going to swim. And I think, I think Kristen Wolf Jensen uh, swims, if I'm not mistaken. So I think it was kind of contagious in the studio. Um, but I remember that as a young bassoonist helping with my breath. In a sense, just, you've only got one second take a good breath when you're swimming a good nice deep nourishing wow. breath so that you can keep going sort of thing and I guess similarly with running but you won't drown if you, <laughs> but you've got to be, be efficient in your breathing playing to live and living to play would you want to yeah. share any thoughts on that Nicole yeah. Yeah, it's so funny because when we were brainstorming this yes. <laughs> like a, a few weeks ago, or maybe like a month or two ago, I feel like my brain was in a point where I, I, I was adamantly like, I play the bassoon so I can live my life, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so that I can spend time with my family or go to baseball games or eat amazing food or drink coffee or something. But now, yes. now that I'm in Chicago, I'm at the Grant Park Music Festival right now, like seven weeks into the summer season. There's a part of me that's like, I live to play. Uh -huh. Because I think I had, I'd been so out of the orchestra when we had talked two months ago or so. Like I hadn't really worked in the orchestra every week for like 16 months or something crazy. But now that I'm here playing the rep with the amazing soloists or working with the conductors, there's a part of me that's like, oh, I don't know. I, I live so I can play this. Like what a privilege it is to wake up and go to rehearsal. So I was so, I was, 
uh, when I was thinking about this question before this, it had me thinking, oh my gosh, what do I do? Do I live? Do I play so I can live? Mm. Oh my gosh. Which is funny. Two months ago, it was so black and white for me, but I, I, it made me realize this is a fluid thing because I definitely love like work-life balance. There's actually, you know, there's an, a book coming out. There's an author, Christy Wright, who's really into women's business. She has this like time management book coming out that I've been uh, reading about that's about uh, like doing the right stuff at the right time in whatever season of life that is. Like this past week has been a, a busy season of life for me between concerts and gouging cane and just life and friends have been coming through Chicago and I had to remind myself I just need to be doing the right stuff at the right time mm -hmm. where I feel like yeah there's been a balance where I have been playing I've been living to play but I've also been playing so that I can go eat Korean barbecue or like this is um you know have um have those friendships and connections it's so fluid it's it's just mm -hmm. I, I I'm shocked at myself because Two months ago, I was adamantly mm -hmm. in another position. I'm like, like this is work. work. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. I feel like two months ago, I was like, this is work. And some days I might wake up and I'm like, okay, going to work. But uh -huh. then I'm like, wow, how thankful am I to do this thing? Like, mm -hmm. for a living. It's amazing. I, it's a big thing, like, doing the right stuff at the right time. Like, that always... Because there are times where I feel like I haven't seen friends enough, or I haven't seen certain friends enough, you know, but sometimes you just got to take care of business. What makes a good orchestra friend and colleague? Yeah, where they make your job easier. So I play second bassoon and assistant principal, so I have, mm. like, two perspectives. Like, as a second bassoonist, what I like to sit next to, and then when I'm playing principal, what I like to sit next to sort of thing. I think they're similar. Um, when I play second bassoon, I try and play second bassoon like I would want someone to play if I was playing principal. And mm -hmm. I think I do that inspired by colleagues in my mind. Like, I always love when, I mean, it's just the simple things of showing up to rehearsal a little bit early mm -hmm. and settling into your chair. I mean, you would be shocked. I have been in some orchestras where some people might come on five minutes before rehearsal or something. And though, you know, I guess it really shouldn't bother me, but whenever someone's next mm -hmm. to you, scurrying and things like that. So I always admire when someone is just there. They're, they are present and calm and not... Um, rushing onto the stage and they're you know just nice and I think also at the end of the day even when I just think about our wind section even if there's only eight of us on stage if you looked at all eight of us and you asked us oh yeah what does Martin say to this one has too many parts to only be there five minutes early I know so it's not the soonest <laughs> craziness is going on in your life I bet each person has something absolutely insane happening whether it's a sick child or a car accident or this or that and so I always admire um, a colleague maybe it's too harsh to say don't bring that into work like I think it's totally fine to be like present in rehearsal and be like wow this has been a bad week you know so and so sick or I was in a car accident but not bringing it bringing that energy into work. I think I think that negative energy is contagious in, mm -hmm. in a way, but I think positive energy is also contagious. So I, I am human and I want to know, um, I, I want to know what's going on in someone's life, but there's another point where it's like, you have to work to live, you live to work, where it's work. And I'm like, I'm so in my head, you know, just being calm, present, friendly, communication. Mm -hmm. I, I think it does all kind of 
comes down to what energy we're radiating and communication when we're fixing pitch problems and mm -hmm. rhythm problems. And it's a unique situation here at Grant Park because we don't have a lot of rehearsal time. Mm -hmm. So we, we do, like, I find when I'm sitting principal or even if I'm sitting second and a principal player is communicating with me, we do communicate very short and to the point because there's not a lot of time, but there's a way to do it respectfully. And so I just always, I look up to it and to people that do that and I try to emulate it when I'm a leader. I, you know, I look up to people that lead well do and I try and carry that into what I do as a leader. I'm trying to think what makes a good leader a good mm -hmm. leader also, mm -hmm. you know? Knowing when, knowing when to share to. Maybe not 10 minutes before rehearsal or a concert, but in the break room or, mm -hmm. you know, like, just, yeah, do it, saying the right things at the right time or something, you know? Because we're all, we are all probably going through something at the end of the day. It helps being like, yeah, how was your day? Like, are you doing okay? It was yes. like, is it, and it reminds yes. me that perspective. Yes. Mm. Little things like that. One, one of my mentors here at Grant Park, my first season and like my second season, and even now we sit down and if it's a Saturday, you know, we didn't have rehearsal. We just have the concert Saturday night. He's always, will always ask, did you do anything fun today? Or, uh, you know, oh, what, oh, did you have a good weekend? It's just little things. And, of course, when I actually say things, that person is receptive and listening to me and not just, it's not just a one-off sort of like, oh, how's it going? You know, and, like, no one really wants to know how, how it's going, you know? But just those small, but, of course, when you show it to rehearsal early enough, you can have, like, that human connection. There's that time to make that connection, you know? When, because I'm I'm a nester, I love to get on stage and nest. Maybe yes. my worst quality, best quality, I don't know. I like to get on stage. Make it your home. So yeah. Like thirty minutes before, as soon as the stage is open, I'm making a nest. <laughs> Gotta put my bassoon stand. But I think yeah, that does allow me. It allows me that time to make some personal connections because yeah, we're making music together. It's super intimate. Mm -hmm. You know, and I feel like to have that, that time to communicate and I, I always love to keep it light too. I feel like even, even as it's close to downbeat, just yeah, keep it light, happy, positive vibes, like keep, it's contagious. Bad energy is contagious. I mean, as soon as someone starts complaining, you watch it, there's a bunch of other people complaining about that same thing, but I think just keeping it positive and fun and yeah because these yeah these connections are so important you never know who you're gonna meet that's gonna be important in your life you know yeah, yeah you certainly yeah. don't just want to like sit down next to a body and be like okay we're sacks of like <laughs> flesh here playing the bassoon or an, an <laughs> bassoon or something but like it's nice having that human element because yeah i mean what we do is so vulnerable I mean, we uh, just rip our heart out of the chest and uh, put it on stage, you know? Like, it's, uh, it's, it's so good to ha just have that, that connection rather than just, okay, initiate the soon sequence, you know, or something. So, Nicole, in your interview, you mentioned about your joy of geology and gemstones and wanted to ask you about the Big Buddha. So could you share with us about who the Big Buddha is and how this helps you with music performance anxiety? Yes. Oh, my gosh, certainly. So at uh, Grant Park, uh, there's someone in the orchestra who has a big Buddha. A, um, it's beautiful. It's almost like a translucent green and yellow. And she purchased little Buddhas for all of the wind section. And we each have our own little Buddha. And she has the big Buddha. And I, I try to be very sensitive because I'm not Buddhist and I don't want to certainly mock any religion, but mm. um, the little Buddha, I, um, when I received it years ago, I always kept it in my reed case. And it became a thing at Grant Park. We would all 
We're going to stick our little Buddhas on our stand. There's so uh-huh. much little rehearsal time that um, sometimes it's kind of that symbol where we're all like, whoo, this is, like, you know, we're nervous. We're like, we don't know what's going to happen on the radio tonight. And every now and then, someone might put their little Buddha on. Or like, I was thinking last weekend we played Tchaikovsky 1 and Sibelius Violin Concerto. You know, not a lot of rehearsal time. When you do three programs a week, it's nuts. And uh, I just brought, I brought the little boot out. And I stuck it on my reed shell. And it's like a, it's like a symbol to me that we're going to nail this. But, um, or, you know, we can, we can do it. I can do it. And uh, I think that kind of goes along to that good colleague energy, too. Mm. where you're in it together yeah 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 yeah. and it's kind of it it's a little bit maybe silly you know again Mm. I don't think we're intending to mock uh, anything but I mean we each also got to pick what colors our buddhas were so I have this beautiful kind of blue purple Mm -hmm. buddha and the details are amazing Mm-hmm. I, I love it. Um, it's like a, a little symbol for me that <laughs> when it seems like it's not going to be okay, it's going to be okay. Yeah. And I always, I, I, so I sometimes joke that I try and bring that big Buddha energy to the rehearsal. Like, especially playing second bassoon, because when I'm playing principal, I love to sit next to someone that's just calm. Even if you're not calm, fake it. So I always try and bring <laughs> that sort of like energy as a person, supportive, like so that no one has to worry about me. Because one of my pet peeves when you're, I'm sure anyone's pet peeve when you're playing principles is you're having to kind of worry what's going on next to you. So I, when I'm really second, I try and emulate that. And I, on phone calls with friends, I, I will, you know, joke about just having that calm, zen, centered energy it, it, and it, it definitely helps you with performance anxiety it's kind of something where you can just label your fear because fear is a liar you know so i feel like anytime before a concert i'm worried about something being able to be like that's a lie mm-hmm. we got this mm-hmm. you know and then yes. and like a huge alexander technique principle of like thinking you know my head is up and light and my feet are on the floor. And so whenever I'm sitting in the chair, I am thinking about how grounded I am or like sitting on my sit bones connected to the chair, my feet are on the floor, like envisioning the wide space of the room. And yeah, and I, I don't think I mentioned this earlier, but my father studied geology and in um, my interview, I talked, a, I think I talked a little bit about um, how I had initially gone to school for petroleum engineering. I kind of inspired because my brother is a brilliant engineer. He's an aerospace engineer, and I, I thought that maybe engineering was going to be good for me, but it turned out I hated it. It's very miserable. And actually, it's funny having Richard Meek here because when I transferred schools, I applied to the University of Texas at Austin, and also I remember auditioning at Texas Tech years and years ago in my young young bassoonist days, but I still, I mean, I think about my geology class freshman year at Colorado School of Mines, and you know, I loved it. I still love, like, geological formations and seeing the different layerings, and oh, something happened in this era, and that's why it's like that, and so that's always fascinating. I always collected rocks as a kid. I still kind of collect rocks. I wish I had some rocks here in Chicago, but I was thinking, there's this one rock I have, I forget I picked it up, I think in Vermont, and it looks like cookies and cream ice cream. Like it's a white rock with just black specks, or there's a beautiful yin and yang type rock, or, or like, I guess, like a black and white New York cookie type rock. <laughs> yes. It's super cool. So I always, kind of, yeah, I guess love things from the earth, which, of course, back to the grounding, mm-hmm. grounding principles of being calm. Having just yeah, it's like just having good energy, you know. Mm-hmm. It's so important. Well, I'd love to hear more about your reed making. 
Yes, so I make reads. Oh, I see Richard Meeks at Texas Tech is for petroleum engineering, not Colorado School of Mines. You know, it's funny enough because I always wonder what my life would have been like had I gone to a different school. Like, I wonder if I had gone to, like, Texas Tech, or I applied to Texas A&M also, and the University of Texas for engineering, but young 18-year-old me wanted to get out of Texas for some reason. What a funny idea. And I wonder what my life would have been like if I went to a different school. I don't think I would be here where I am today. It's crazy to think. It's crazy, crazy to think about where life takes us. Yes, yeah. It's so wild. It's so nuts to think, yeah, where, oh yeah, how life takes us on this journey. But after Colorado School of Mines, when I transferred, I ended up on the University of Texas with Kristen Wolf Jensen. There's a, there's a big connection of a lot of people that go from UT Austin and end up at Rice for their masters. And I feel like there's some trickle down of the read making. And um, so a few of my older studio mates when I was a freshman were making reads in the Hertzberg style of the read making. I think at the time Kristen was experimenting with different shapes and doing a little bit of the Hertzberg stuff, but I think early on to my UT days, I just committed and just started using the Hertzberg shape. And I'm going to be honest, I have not uh, experimented much. I have a few colleagues that are very into trying different shapes, but I sort of started using the shape and then I just learned more and more from different people from either studio mates and then eventually after the University of Texas in my journey crazily enough I was denied at Rice and I didn't get into Colburn I didn't get into any schools for masters my first time around and so I moved to San Antonio Texas where my parents lived where I'm born and raised and it just so happens as the principal of the students there, Sharon Custer, studied with Norman Hertzberg. And so it was a very intentional move for me to come home because I knew Sharon was there and I needed, I just needed more read guidance. And also the way Norman Hertzberg is with the etude system. And ah, yes, Sharon is amazing. She's, she is the student mama. You know, I saw her every week and I had also talked to Ben Haymans. I was like, what do I need to do, you know? Because I had transferred schools from being an engineering major, and at this point I had purchased my heckle. So I was like knee deep in this. Like, I needed to make this work. I didn't, you know, and I, I didn't even really know what I was getting into at this point still, but I feel like Sharon gave me some amazing guidance and continues to give me amazing guidance in the read-making style. And then for master's, I had a very targeted approach where I applied to master's schools second time around. I ended up going to Rice University, but I also, I applied to DePaul University in Chicago, which some people might say, that's weird, but Miles Maynard's there, and I was like, I need, and Bill Buckman's amazing, I mean, Keith Funky teaching at DePaul now, I think at the time Drew Addison was there, and then I applied to Ohio State with Carrie Pearson, because, again, that Hertzberg connection, I just... For me personally, my bassoon playing, read making is like 90% of my problem. Just give me a good read and we can play the the bassoon, you know? (laughs) Yes. And so at at Rice, um, I really, really got into it um, with Ben Kamen's just learning how to consistently make a good read. And I guess just having the the setup to make a good read. Um, I don't have a Hertzberg profiler and I'm actually... Um, using an MD profiler still. I've been waiting for a Greg James profiler. Uh, Greg makes scouters and profilers in Toronto. And, um, but I've been using MD with decent success since I was at UT. I'm able to tinker with it enough to get something manageable. And then I'm using a Greg James gouger which, if you're not familiar, is a side clamping gouger. Okay. I wish I had a piece of gouger. And uh, usually the normal RDG gougers clamp just on the edges, or, or the uh, top, uh, you know, the uh-huh. Uh-huh. long part of the reed, and then the Greg James gouger clamps on the entire side of the reed, and it is a super consistent gouge. I mean, this is where my nerd brain goes 
crazy. So I, my read making starts even from the tube of just in a very intentional way of splitting the tube based on kind of how the vascular bundles are sitting and then cutting to length and of course gouging with the Greg James gouger, sorting by density, by, I use weight actually oddly uh -huh. enough, uh -huh. instead of a hardness tester. Cool. And then shaping with the Hertzberg um, shaper and profiling with my MD and just making a ton of reads. Mm -hmm. Which is, it's different for everyone. And I will say, I, I know, I, I at least know one person that studied with Mona Hersford that doesn't start from a tube. Mm -hmm. And they work from gouge game. They sound mm -hmm. amazing. Mm -hmm. you know, so there's just, there's not one way to do it. And it, you're not wrong if you're starting from gouge cane or something too. You're not wrong. You're a bad person if you're starting from GSP cane, you know? So it's kind of, I do all of this stuff because it makes me feel better. I I, I, I feel like it makes a difference for me. So, mm -hmm. but I make um, the minimum amount of reads I make during the orchestra season is six a week. Mm -hmm. And during the pandemic, I would make. Well, I took some time off, of course, but then once I was back in it, I was playing a lot. I wasn't going for reads like I do in the orchestra season, so I was making three a week, I think, just to keep the skills up, and I make yes. everything basically with a diamond file, no uh -huh. knife involved. Uh -huh. I um, put the tip in with a uh, gem uh, stainless steel coated razor blade, uh -huh. an RDG, I think Midwest Musical Import sells them too, but... My read making doesn't involve a knife, and even if I think if your read making does involve a knife, it's a skill. So during the pandemic, once I was playing a little bit, um, I put three reads a week just to keep that skill up because, oh my gosh, you don't use it, I think you lose it, maybe. Mm -hmm. At mm -hmm. least for me, mm -hmm. right? This is such a, goes back to how this is such a personal practice, you mm -hmm. know? Mm -hmm. And I find... Even, you know, people might be like, well, how do you do the Norman Hertzberg read-making way the right way? I don't know. I honestly think if you mm -hmm. had two Hertzberg students, mm -hmm. I think they'd be exactly the same. Or someone might come to me and ask me how I make a read because they want to know what Ben Caymans does. And I'm like, let me tell you, we got a lot of things similar. Mm -hmm. But I also have my own twang. Yeah. You know, or even like thinking about my studio mates that I was actively in school with, we, you know, mm -hmm. it's like slightly different things that we find works for us because at the end of the day, it's a personal practice. And I think this kind of like goes back to this like big thing of like, you've got to be you, mm -hmm. you know, you got to do what works for, for you, but. Yeah, remaking is a huge thing. I oh, I wish I had all my blanks out. I, I leave Chicago in a uh, about a, a week and a day, so I packed up all my blanks. They used to sit at the corner of the table. I think there's like 63 mummies cool. out, what? or 67, and then I have a small pile of like hot glue reeds just cool. around. You know, um, like some people like to have an emergency fund of money in case an accident happens or something. <laughs> Like emergency fund of reads. Mm -hmm. That's what keeps me calm and sleeping at night. So <laughs> everyone, not you know, not everyone does. You gotta do what works. Mm -hmm. you sort of thing, you know. Mm -hmm. I love to have a little stash. I have found that sometimes I've had a humongous stash of blanks, and then I'll decide to change something in my read making. <laughs> Then I have a long discussion of reads that haven't, uh, haven't the new thing that I've decided to experiment with. Uh huh. <laughs> I'm like, there's just like a small enough stash of hot glue things. Uh -huh. Yeah, I remember <laughs> looking back at like realizations and reads where it's like, okay, that wasn't in my consciousness yet, and looking back on them like, but it's always always room for improvement. <laughs> yeah. And mm -hmm. one of the reasons I was just thinking of why I haven't experienced experimented much is because I think 
when I won my Grant Park audition here in Chicago. Going into the summer season, I was, uh, it was my first job out of school and, you know, playing second bassoon. Mostly I was worried, like, oh my gosh, I'm going to need to read the response. Like, oh my gosh, I need to do something weird. Ah! And mm-hmm. so I was using the Hertzberg shape at Rice. And then I decided with some guidance from a mentor to perhaps try dry shaping with the Hertzberg shape, so shaping while the cane is dry, yeah. and crazily enough, even though it's dry versus wet, it is wider. Wow. Because, so if you shape cane wet, you shape it and you uh-huh. cut it, and then it dries and it shrinks. Yes. The tiniest bit, super, and this is a, I guess maybe a more advanced concept to think, but even like thinking about cutting your hair. When your hair's wet, it's longer. You cut it, it's like a tiny bit shorter. Yes. So n- normally we shape cane wet. And it uh-huh. it. So I had experimented with dry shaping. I I ran an experiment, which was so, so stupid looking back on it, my first summer on the job. And this is why I don't experiment. I like have some trauma inside still. I, uh, ma- I made a hundred blanks. Uh-huh. Three of them were wet shaped mm-hmm. and 30 of them were the cane was only soaked for maybe six hours or mm-hmm. something like something where it wasn't all the way wet but it had time to expand and then mm. um, well i guess maybe i didn't make 100 degrees maybe it was like 33 33 33 or something mm. and then i made the other third dry shaped and let me tell you that first summer on the job a third of my roots didn't work None of the dry shaped roots did. You could do the, yeah. You could do the Skinner technique. It's all dry except for folding in the middle. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Gouge dry. Profile dry. Yeah, it's crazy. So I did that my first summer on the job because I was worried about my reeds responding, which I don't I was just in a mind like a mind F for lack of a better word. Mm-hmm. A lot of self-doubt happening, even though I won the audition on the second episode. I don't know why I was trying to change stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, I kind of learned that summer that what I was doing was working. Why am I trying to mess with it? Mm -hmm. And, I mean, that summer was three years ago, 2018, and I still am hesitant to change things. I Mm -hmm. I, you know, it's funny because even a few of my friends my age are trying different shapes, but... I mean, trauma is a big word. It was like a little T trauma, you know, but I was first year on the job trying to get tenure. A third of my reads aren't working. And I was just thinking, Mm -hmm. why would I do this to myself? Mm -hmm. And it all stemmed from a place of self-doubt. And I thought I needed to do that. But at the end of the day, I didn't. But I'm I'm glad I learned that lesson. It was a small lesson to learn. I mean, I had enough reads. Mm -hmm. It ended up being fine. Better to learn the lesson early on. It's kind of, so I'm, it's a purely from, I guess, a safety standpoint mm-hmm. of why I don't experiment. And you know what? I'm just, I know this system. I know the Nicole Haywood, you know, variation on the Hertzberg, Ben Caymans, whatever. And uh, I just am stuck with it. Because if they broke, don't fix it. That's mm-hmm. my biggest advice. I find that people that experiment with things usually go back to what they were doing. I don't know. But, but I also, I admire that, um, like, pursuit of not being complacent. Because there has to be something better. Mm-hmm. I mean, the equipment, the Hertzberg system is amazing, but it's 2021. I do think mm-hmm. there's got to be something better. But right now, I'm not the person to <laughs> <laughs> You know, so I just, I ad- admire that sense of... Uh, like in not being complacent because complacency can be bad and it's finding that balance with the art of read making where yeah. you know in our art we like to experiment and try different you know yeah. canvases or you know different paint or yeah different files or knives and so but it's like yeah. what do we keep constant and it yeah. and it is so personal I love that you brought that up Nicole yeah. and mm-hmm. I mean, even even during the pandemic I uh 
thickened up my profile a little bit. Mm-hmm. Just some like flatness problems on strange notes, like not the tenor range. I feel like A in the bass left staff was flat. And I was like, oh my god, I think this is too thin. And then I thickened up my profiler and Goldilocks. Yes. Or ben- <laughs> Banana of Life is something Ben Candace yes. and Ryan Crapo would talk about where you're like trying to get to this point of a good thickness on the profiler, but you just whoop all the way over here. And then my profiler was so thick, I was just breaking up the heavy duty profile or the heavy duty file. And then now I've kind of gotten it to this stage. So I do experiment with tiny things. This is my profile mm-hmm. level. <laughs> mm-hmm. I'm like, ooh, I'm like, let's get wild and try and thicken up the profile. <laughs> It's like, I'm going to scrape a little bit more on the channels, and that's, like, rogue. That's plenty (laughs) to experiment with. I know, I know. I know I'm very, very vanilla when it comes Uh to it. But I think it all comes from that summer of 2018. I remember it like it was yesterday when a third of my reads didn't work. Because shaping dry with the Hertzberg shape, uh, the read is not only wider. The whole shape's wider, right? The flare at the butt of the shape is wider, but Bigger oh my gosh, the tube mm-hmm. is wider, and um, I thought it was going to help the low range, mm. and uh, I guess it did help the low range, but none of the tenor range, I couldn't play, yeah. like, nothing mm-hmm. was up to pitch, mm-hmm. it was just, mm-hmm. not a single read out of the dry shape for me personally was, um, I didn't practice on a single uh-huh. one or the mm-hmm. first mm-hmm. in the rehearsal. Which is funny because, crazily enough, when I was at UT, when I was at the University of Texas, I was dry shaping and it was working for me. Mm-hmm. But whatever I have accustomed to at this point, it did not work. So the re- uh, one of the reasons why I ran that experiment was because I knew it worked for me while I was at UT. But that had been so long. I mean, uh, it was 2018 when I ran that experiment. I graduated from UT in 20. 20- 14. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I was a different person, you know, and I'm also, you know, you're like early 20s and you, your body's probably changing some still, you know? Mm-hmm. It's so crazy. But yeah, reads. I love them. Love them. <laughs> <laughs> Nicole, could you share with us about your instrument journey and any fun quirks about your bassoon? And it would be amazing to, to hear about that. Yeah. I'm going to grab my bassoon here in a second. So I purchased my instrument while I was at the University of Texas. I can't remember if it was, I want to feel like it was 2013. And I remember it's just a few days before my brother's birthday, which I was like, this is kind of rude to be making a huge purchase for my <laughs> birthday. Um, and I play on a 10,000 series heckle is what I ended up purchasing. And it took me for it. I tried so many instruments. I feel like eight or something. Uh-huh. I wish I had kept track. I kind of wish I had kept track of all the different serial numbers. And I tried a bell, and it's just such a large purchase to make. I wanted it to feel perfect. Mm-hmm. And I feel like I was constantly bringing in bassoons to Kristen, and you know they were okay. They were better than my Fox. Mm-hmm. My Fox 240 at the time, but. It took a while, and I do love my instrument very, very much. I bought it from David Savage, his second bassoon in Virginia Symphony. I think at the time he was, I think he had a, maybe two pebbles, and he was switching to a vaulter at the time. I'm not sure what he's playing on now, and he sold this tin to me, which I'm so grateful for. And Carl Swicky did a little bit of work on it at the time to replace the keys and I love the bones of the instrument, like, I guess, like, the sound, the intonation, the scale is great, and so Carl, um, I'm so thankful that he helped with some of the cosmetic problems. The, the keys were just tarnished, and they weren't going to last through my career, so he did you know, two really big chunks of time to get it to where it needed to be, and I, oh, I love it so much. But there's a, and it's a funny part. It's going to be yes. I'm going to go grab my instrument because the bell. Oh, yeah. I call it the birthmark. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, I call it the birthmark on the instrument. So, you know, normal bell, but over here, crazy enough, um, the best guess that either, like, 
Carl could come up with, and Ken Podsik has been working on my instrument. Now, this birthmark glows under UV light. It's pretty nice. It's fun. It's fun at raves and parties. Um, but <laughs> I, I think the best bet is that someone tried to restain the instrument. Uh huh. They must have started with the bell, and they must have realized this stain doesn't match or something. I, I don't know what happened. Maybe they just tried to cover something up, but it's something I, I it's something that I guess is maybe unique to my bassoon. Yeah. But I pulled a birthmark. At first I thought, wow, this is hideous. Um, but I love the instrument. The it's beautiful. Uh, it's, it's amazing. But um, I think I started viewing this in a positive light. I think it's early on since buying it. Mm-hmm. Because I, I adore the tiger striping, but it's just me. Mm-hmm. So, and it used to, I had purchased it with the original ivory on it. Um, mm. The pandemic can, wow. sadly enough, um, remove my ivory. It was another big, kind of, you know. What's the, what's the number? Is it an early 10 or a late 10? A late 10. 10, 9, 3, 2. And Kim did a beautiful job on uh, the, the replica. It's swirled and marbled, but I am, um, I, you know, just in case I go on tour, but um, I had a wedding that was out of the country, crazily enough, during my second year at Grant Park, and I didn't have tenure yet, and I couldn't bring my bassoon, which I think was a good, again, living to play playing to live. I think it was good that I didn't bring my bassoon to an international wedding, but I, there was something in my stomach because I had been, you know, I've been playing principal for a few weeks. I didn't quite get have tenure. I'm nervous, and it would have been nice if I had brought my bassoon, if I could have had the option, but I didn't, and so that was a, kind of a, just that feeling in my stomach that week of anxiety about um, the bassoon was one of the reasons that people need it finally get the ivory removed because I, I have heard that the process just in and out of the country is just difficult. That yes. it's possible, but it's difficult. I'm going to put this back in the case. Sure. So I don't accidentally. <laughs> <laughs> Even with the proper documentation flying out of certain airports. You, you um, can, but, you, you can, but you're at the total mercy of the TSA agents. Yeah, yes, and so it, was, it kind of broke my heart to finally remove it. It actually, the ivory came off in one piece, and so I have the, the ring. Um, wow. Here. Oh, I, it, it's also in another box somewhere, but it's, I guess it's neat to still have it. It feels so bad because these instruments are so special, so historic, and to um, destroy a bell, basically, right, because of the current regulations, but... Supposedly, heck will give you certification of its age and so on that you can show and it should justify bringing it in. Yes, and I do have a letter. I, I Years ago when this first started, I got the letter from Heckle saying the ivory was harvested. I, I think my instrument was made in 1965 or something. So that the instrument was, the ivory was harvested before the Endangered Species Act of well, 1984. I can't remember. I'll have to, to fact check on Google. But... I just, uh, I was just worried. Did it change the sound, Nicole? Like when you when you played on it, did it or like no, noticeably different? All. Interesting. That's amazing. I I think maybe purely cos cosmetic. Uh huh. Uh huh. Actually. Wow. Hmm. Yeah, and it just felt so strange to like. It's funny. I feel like in thirty years, no, fifty years, maybe. Maybe we're gonna be like, remember that time we all removed our ivory? Or we all had problems with that. Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe we won't. I don't know. Catch me and <laughs> interview me in 40 yes. years. Yes. Watch this space. Okay, Nicole. That's a but deal. Yeah, it's a time capsule. Like a time capsule. <laughs> what? Yeah. Right? 50 years from now, we're still going to be hanging out together. I yes. love that. As uh, yes. <laughs> yes. Thank you for your time, Nicole.